Okay, welcome back to another upholstery question and answer session. Uh, I got some exciting stuff to show you here. Um, and as usual, we're starting a little early today because last week we noticed that we started to motor be, uh, towards the end of our question and answer. We started getting a lot of people asking questions. So we're going to start a little early today. So um, that's why if you're tuning in. So we gotta, we got to get rid of that echo. So, so what we're going to do, at first I'm going to show you some chairs, dining room chairs that came into the shop. And boy, I am in for it with these ones as far as labor goes. So these are the jobs that you really have to be careful with when you're pricing for all those who are, who are getting paid for their work. Um, and even if you were doing this for yourself, these type of chairs, they're, they're modern chairs. They're made to look like some French, uh, rough, uh, really antique French chairs. But the thing about these, uh, the hardest thing about these chairs is they have a finished recessed back here. And you put your outside back on first, facing this way, the good facing this way. And the problem, even though it's a desired look, one of the problems is that the newer furniture, they never give you enough to, to staple to. And there's a lot of stapling that goes on here. I've worked probably about myself, about an hour on trying to get most of the staples out. And I think I got most of them, but I still have some in there. So what happened is... I was using my, um, and by the way, two of the chairs came with the backs broken, so I had to send them out to get it repaired. Um, they break, usually they break right about here. So that was one, one hassle. Um, fortunately, I saw those when they came in, so, so we, we, we were able to tell the client, and um, you know, that's a separate charge for that. But um, they're ready to... They're ready to be upholstered, but I have a lot of uh, staples to take out. So on a job like this, um, usually you will go over on your labor. Uh, you're, you're, you're doing more labor, and you're not, um, you're not making as much money on these as you would as a result. Because when you're using your awl and your mallet, which is the best way to take staples out, my tack remover, not so good. It's a little too thick on the end. You really have to almost surgically go in here and be careful not to dent around here because, like I said, this is this is recess. So there's a lot going on here. So I think uh, to start, I think I'm going to try to I'm going to tackle the seat now to see what's going on there. Hopefully, we can save ourselves a little bit since this is just a reupholstery. Really, um, hopefully, I'm going to be able to reuse a lot of the bottom. So let's let's just take out. So this had a contrasting double piping, which they had run up here. Um, they're having that all the same uh, this time in the fabric, but it is going to be double piped. So what I'm going to do is take this apart and ask your questions. Um, uh, you know, as I go, I can stop at any point. So there's one good thing that the, the double piping is coming off easily because it was glued. So sometimes, though, what happens is uh, a manufacturer or some upholsters will staple through the through the piping. Sometimes this is even hard to take out. But this is because this has just been glued. It's really coming off easy for me. Finally, I got something easy, right? So we're going to take that off. I'm using my side cutters to do that. I'm grabbing hold of one end, and I'm pulling. I'm really happy that. And that took the fabric with it, but that's okay. That actually helps me. I'll throw this away. And then I'm going to try to grab as many of the staples with the fabric. Trying to use the fabric as leverage, you know, as much as I can. Right now I'm working on the side of this. Normally I'd be sitting down and um, getting even better leverage, but I'm doing this for the benefit of the camera. So we had a good session last week. We got a lot of, we have a lot of questions. Really good, really good questions. I hope that I answered those properly for you. And one of those was, I think, about a channel back. How to stuff a channel back. And um, I promise I'll get a channel back in here and show you um, how to do that. But um, manufacturers, the thing about channel backs, most of the times you see a channel back, it's a manufactured piece. And they have a special machine that does that from the top. It goes in, in between the channels and makes that stitch. We don't have the benefit of that as custom upholsters. We, we have a straight, I have a straight jukey, that's it. So we have to devise ways sometimes of, of um, doing it ourselves the way with the equipment that we have. 
Not too many upholsters are going to go out and buy a, a $5,000 sewing machine to make channel backs the easy way. I can tell you that. So, But you have to find an easy way. So I, I promise um, I'm going to show you a good way of doing that coming up. So I think that I mentioned, I think I did that. I have eight of these. So what I'm trying to do is, the, the, the thing about it too is I have to be careful of the wood. I have to be careful not to put any divots in this. So what I'm doing is I'm strategically, if you notice, I'm pulling up away from the wood like this as much as I can. I don't want to use my, my uh, ply grips to, to kind of go around the wood. Excuse me for a second. Somebody's asking a question on the, on the phone? No, I don't think so. Let me just shut that off. Sorry, I thought I shut that off. So um, I'm going to remove this fabric. You can even tear the fabric like so and try to get it and pull it. See that pulled off pretty nicely. Look at that. And I think I've shown you in other videos with some fabrics, fabrics always pull one way better than the other. So one way it'll rip, the other way it will pull but not rip and that means that you can grab some staples with you. So that's, that's the goal when you're doing this, to try to get as many staples up like so as you can, using the fabric as leverage. Okay, so pull this through this way. Okay, that came off pretty easy, but I still have staples left, so let's take a look at that. Now I'm gonna sit down to get better leverage. I tell you, leverage is so important when you're working upholstery. Do we have any questions yet, Patrick? Not yet, I got a few people checking in though. Okay, good. I think Sylvia had some really good questions last last week. I hope that your projects are coming out really good. And I hope that the online classes, for those of you, we have a lot of people now online but, uh, watching, for all of you who haven't, right now we're, we're working with Jimmy. And um, he's, he's really a talented guy. He's doing really good on an ottoman. So if you've ever wanted to upholster an ottoman, um, watch Jimmy's class or sign up for Jimmy's class. Um, he he um, he did a great job. His ottoman was a little challenging because it was it was also a modern ottoman, and there were certain problems that we had to overcome in order to make it look good. Um, one of them was that around here um, there was staples that were embedded in the, in the piece. It was like kind of like a groove, and we had to find a way to not take the staples out because taking the staples out would damage the ottoman. But all that's in his class. And the thing about the class is much more than the YouTube videos. I, I can't stress this enough. I really like the classes. I like the classes because of the students. So far we have two students, Michelle and Jimmy. And the questions that they're asking and the things that I'm showing them on camera is something that you know, uh, I wouldn't sh necessarily show you when I'm upholstering uh, in a YouTube video. I mean, they ask all the right questions. I think that the, every class, um, usually there's six weeks, although the last class with Michelle's going, it's going to go eight weeks. Um, she's got a tub chair, and so that's coming up. A tub chair, an ottoman, and don't forget, you can sign up for any class anytime and get all the classes. And you can jump in with Jimmy's class, even though it's it's moving along, you can always jump in and get all the classes. So, and that's broadwayupholsteryschool.com, right Pat? Yeah. So, I'm gonna try to get all the, I'm gonna go around and get all the loose, all the staples that are sticking out, okay? I'm trying to be careful. I don't wanna see one divot or ding on this finished wood. Then if I do that, um, I have to call the refinisher in and there goes more of my profit right out the window, right? Or if you're doing it on your own, time, time wasted. So, um, I can tell you right now, I'm not going to be able to get every single staple. And don't feel like, when you get a job like this, people feel like they got to get every single staple. Man, if you do that, you're going to do more damage. Um, so I'm going to the first layer of staples that are sticking out and then I'm going to examine it to see if I can get what else I'm going to be able to get without damaging the wood. I'll show you that in a minute. So I'm going to go right along. Notice how I'm, tr I'm kind of trying to go away from the finished wood by rolling my, my ply grips up like this. 
and I'm not snapping the I'm not snapping I'm not breaking the the, the staple. I'm rolling I'm rolling them I'm rolling them I'm not going to I'm just holding it enough to roll it grab hold of it and roll it. Just wanted to mention too the blog is up our blog is up. You can find that on the website also, broadwayupholsteryschool.com. And we've got some interesting stories. I think um, the, the Napoleon story is up. Um, we've got, uh, uh, I won't tell you the story about the second story. It's, it's called the uh, Salty Love Seat or something like that. And I don't want to give it away, but um, you should go on and look. It's kind of fun. I'm going to be remembering these stories. I've got a lot of them um, over the years related to upholstery. Um, so I, I'd like to get into into those too, which we are. And a lot of lot of things going on. We're going to be having our just want to mention too coming up. I'm really excited about the fundamentals of upholstery um, A to Z in a in a in a kit form. Um, I'm really excited about this because. I think it's a way for you to entertain your friends if you want. I have six friends uh, doing upholstery. It's going to come with all the tools and, and I mean all the supplies and the instructions which are paramount. The instructions are what the focus is. The video that we, we just filmed a new video. Uh, we've re-edited the book once again. I think this is like the 13th, 13th time we've done that over the years. Now I finally think we got it and we're going to be offering it and that also will be on the website broadwayupholsteryschool.com so I hope that you guys uh, look at that it's going to be very reasonably priced and um, also the, another use for this is adult ed classes I, I mentioned this and somebody said I can't teach a, a class uh, I'm not ready for that but if you do a stool of these stools if you purchase the video um, you're going to see that you do it and take it apart a couple of times and redo it you become an expert just on that stool and I, uh, that would make a great introduction uh, upholstery class for any adult ed program across the country or across the world. I don't know, I can't speak of uh, outside of the United States, but in the United States, most of the public schools offer adult ed programs. And uh, it's part of your tax dollars. So why not put your tax dollars to good use and uh, propose a class in upholstery using this kit? Um, I'm really excited about it. We've done it before. We, we've we've given this just given the just the book without the video to to a group. A couple of uh, women did this, and they they taught to a group and and they had a great time. It was a six week class, and they, I think they had like eight people in it, and they all finished their ottoman, so they were all happy. So I, I I'm really excited about this. So any question now? And we have our first question. From our omnipotent mama who comments a lot on our stuff. Oh, how you doing? <laughs> so, are the are the ply grips an upholstery tool, or are they from a hardware store, and who makes them? That's a great question. Um, you can get the the ply. This they're also called. So, when you go into your hardware store, any hardware store will have these. So, what I would suggest to do is get a loose pair. Don't get the tight ones. Um, the loose ones are the best because you want to be able to. Um, most of them are designed to cut wire, keep that in mind, and it's usually a one-shot deal, you're not using it over and over again. But every hardware store has them, so they're called, some people call them diagonal pliers, I call them snips sometimes, wire cutters. Um, be careful though when you get, the thing to look at, I'm going to pull this up close to the camera, is that some wire cutters have a long nose on them, don't get, get the snub nose ones, just like this. This is my tool, I've actually taped it with duct tape, that use this tool so much the original um, you know rubber handles fell off and so what I did was I duct taped this so it fits my hand nice it's loose I'm able to wrap the staples nice sometimes I use it for cutting we used it for cutting on wire in here the other day they, they are an essential tool definitely and that was a good question uh, it's not a specialized upholstery tool the wooden mallet um, I think wooden mallets you can get places um, don't go to a, a, a rubber mallet or a stale mallet. Um, the, the, quite honestly, a rubber mallet, if you're going to be using it, a lot of times we use it on fabric. That will stain the fabric. But the main reason is they're heavy. Um, and as you're using this tool, a heavier mallet, you're going to fail it. The wooden mallet's light, 
And usually, and generally, it has a better surface area to hammer with. So when you see me using a mallet, and you guys have to get used to this, I would practice this. So you have three tools. You have the mallet, you have the awl or a pair of um, tack, tack remover, which is this. But let's just say the all for now because that's what I'm using on these and I'm ready to do it anyhow. So you're tapping. So when you're tapping, it's very important that you get used to your tool, that you're not looking up in this area. Most people in the beginning of their careers, they want to look here because they don't want to hurt themselves. They, they think they're going to slip and hurt themselves. You want to be centered. You want to try to get used to not looking here because the important thing is when I'm hammering, I'm not looking up there. I'm looking down here. Because if I'm looking up here, I'm going into the finished wood. So I'm looking down there and I'm looking how I'm doing that. Isn't that nice? It's coming out. So I don't want to get, see how delicate this is. I, if I get too close, that all, if that all picks up the edge of the wood, I just divoted that and I'm in trouble. And Mrs. Jones isn't going to, that's not a real name. <laughs> Mrs. Jones won't, won't be too happy. So this is tedious. Um, I would suggest that you... Have your classical music on or whatever you listen to. Sure. Yeah. All right, and we have questions that came in on email too. So I'm gonna. If do we have Those any? Are other, actually YouTube comments. YouTube comments. Do we have any other questions live though, Patrick? Right now. No, uh, Erica says thank you for answering that. Oh, you're welcome, Erica. So what I'm gonna do now, um, and feel free to ask questions. I'm just going to, I have some questions here from uh, YouTube and Janine a week ago. Sorry, Janine. We, 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 well, that wasn't too bad. Four days, four days, one week and one week. That's not too bad, I guess. Um, so Janine says, hi again. Great information. I have to watch video after live as I have to watch video after live as I'm in Australia. I have a question. Hopefully you can answer next week. Can we make our own edge roll? Oh, I love this question. I really love this question. She's asking if she can make... Can we make our own edge roll out of jute and maybe cotton batting? And could you show us how, please? That is a fantastic question. And yes, of course you can. Because that's how we used to do it in the old days. And there's a couple of ways to do it. So I'm just going to go off camera for a minute to get some burlap. I'll be right back. So... You can either do it on the piece, which I probably would recommend because it's a little easier doing it that way, or you can um, do it off the piece. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a great idea. Um, depending on how big your roll is, let me just get you another roll. So this is, let's say you're doing a finger roll. This is the pre-made stuff. By the way, I have to say that if you can get the pre-made stuff, it is a lot easier. I mean, the pre-made stuff is made with, um, it's got, um, sometimes, this is like a Dacron that they have in here, which, which surprises me. I thought it was a cotton over, and then the burlap over, and then they have a stitch here. Some of them are paper filled, and you can use paper too, by the way, newspaper, if you want. I don't know if that's going to last as long as cotton, so... Cotton probably is your best bet. Triple A cotton is probably your best bet. Let me show you. So if you were to take this and measure this around, that's, um, that's how wide you want to cut your homemade edge roll. So you want to measure from here to here. So I got three inches. So I'm going to cut this three inches. I'm going to lift this up. I didn't want to do this on this, but actually, I don't want to do that. Um, I'm going to show you on top. Let's just pretend I'm on the top of the wood here. And um, if, this isn't, if this isn't that hard, what you want to do is take a layer of cotton, okay, and you want to probably split. You probably want to do about four inches of the cotton, okay? Then what you want to do is double it up, actually roll it, like so this, like you would a dough, like you would make a dough, roll it, roll it, four inches, roll it, and then you place it inside the burlap, right, 
fold the burlap over, and then you're going to tack on this side. You're going to tuck the cotton, your cotton into the, to the front edge, and then you're going to tack that. Usually, I could tell you that if you, if you can use a six ounce tack, you can. But your tack line is where the stitch line of the pre-made stuff would be. So it's in the back. And you can do a really good job with that. And it's, it's, it's not as expensive as this if you make your own. Of course, there's more labor in this. So for all you professionals out there who are deciding, um, most of the times the professionals are buying this just to save time. So, you know, this, this fortunately for me is not a lost art. Um, so I just did want to mention other things. So if you're using a, a bigger roll, obviously you have to cut your burlap wider. Okay, there are two other sizes above, above which are um, the medium and the big. Okay, so, so you probably want to progressively go up an inch width on each one of those. Does that answer your question? That, that is a really good question. I haven't done a hand roll, I have to tell you, a hand roll probably in 35 years because we buy our pre-roll stuff. But maybe one day I'll do that just to show you, do the whole thing and show you, but that's it. Any other questions live, Patrick? Nope. Alrighty. Nice question, Janine, though. I hope that you're doing well in Australia. Let's see if we got another question here. Oh, she, Janine has another question. How can I tell if the springs in the chair are good to reuse or need replacing? So, my experience is I've I very rarely see a broken spring, first of all. I have seen them where they just snap, but to me they, they were probably fault, faulty manufactured. Um, I reuse a lot, unless they're really rusted, uh, then you, you get into a little bit of problem with rusted springs. Uh, sometimes a chair might be exposed to, humid, to, to more humidity or whatever, and it's getting um, rusted, so you may want to replace those. But my experience is that most of the times you can reuse springs. So um, how do you tell? I think if they're rusted, you might want to replace them. And you always want to check springs as you're working on them. Just push them. You know, if they're loose springs, if you took them apart and you're starting from scratch, you can kind of like a like you would a uh, an accordion. You know, just kind of press down to see how the spring is reacting. I can tell you though, seat springs. So. It, uh, seat springs are the heavy gauge springs. They very rarely break. Now back springs, you should never use back springs on seats and, or seat springs on backs because back springs, this, the gauge is a lighter gauge, so those break more. They're a lighter gauge and they're made to be softer. So we, we do see on some really fine furniture springs um, on the back. Now some furniture, there's a, there's a piece called Turkish, Turkish, uh, Turkish chair where there's springs everywhere. There's springs in the seat, there's springs on the seat cushion, there are springs on the, at the arm, on the back, everywhere. And what a, what a tough job those are, just to retie all that. Because usually you get these Turkish chairs where they need a lot of work. So we are looking for some unusual pieces, and I, I got my eyes open for um, some unusual pieces. Um, this was, this was uh, my son's idea, which I think is a good idea. So I was telling him also about if anybody out there has ever heard of a Papa Bear chair, this is a Danish made chair. It's called a Papa Bear chair. I can't remember the designer who made it. But the, the unique thing, I've only seen one, I think, in my career. I upholstered one, maybe two, if, I, I, if I'm remembering. But this one I remembered, it was done in leather. And what the unique thing about this, it looks like a big wing chair, except that it's all wire framed, so that when you sit in it, it has the feeling like a a bear is hugging you from the behind. It's like a bear hug. It, it, it kind of caves in on you. So you can you imagine how difficult that is to upholster. I mean, leave it to the leave it to the Scandinavian area to do this. This is an unbelievable chair, and they were extremely expensive chairs. New, really expensive, and they're not cheap to reupholster. Did one, did a good job on it too, but um, looking for that one of those, looking for some unique pieces. Uh, I was telling Patrick, uh, Patrick joked the other day about um, Abraham, you know, something about Abraham Lincoln's chair, if that was still, if that Abraham Lincoln's chair's assassination chair was still, yes it is, it's, it's in a museum. Um, it probably is a good reminder to us all um, that violence never works for anybody, but anyhow. Um, yeah, so we're looking for unique pieces to, to present, maybe in the question and answer or whatever.
I don't think we'll ever get the linkage here, but if you read the blog, you'll see that um, we did upholster Napoleon's very own chair, and I mentioned that in another question and answer. That we're very proud of that. Um, so let's see. Any more questions, Patrick? No, yeah, no. So we got another one from Janine. Is it possible to back a fabric that has some stretch with the new stretch plain fabric? Let me just read that again. Is it possible to back a fabric? that has some stretch with the non, I think she means a non-stretch plain fabric before cutting out upholstering in order to use that stretch fabric. I think I know what she's saying. Um, so lining a fabric is, usually you line a fabric that has a real problem with its weave to begin with, right? Um, you know, and I wouldn't even, I don't suggest uh, buying a fabric that you have to line I don't think it's a good idea because what happens is it, it takes away the naturalness of the fabric, first of all. It does provide a base, but it's very thick when it's done, especially if you're doing some upholstery fabrics that will just fray at the edges and be no good. I, I think you've got to avoid these fabrics. I, I think that it's, it's just a bad, bad policy to upholster with um, like a Haitian cotton, for instance. It, 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 there's a test in the business called the double rub test. Where there's a machine that just rubs the fabric, right? And the really high performing fabrics, I'd say about 30,000 double rubs, that's really good, and on up. And some commercial grade fabrics go up to 200,000 double rub. A Haitian cotton or a fabric, I think, that Janine is talking about when you're doing a double rub top. Now remember, they do that on the surface. So even if you, even if you line the fabric from the bottom, you're still going to get a bad result on the top. Right? If it does, if it's not a good weave, it's not a good idea. Um, that double rub test, I, I, Haitian cotton, for instance, or a fabric maybe like Janine is talking about, that probably has a 300 to a thousand double rub, which is like hardly anything. I mean, 300 times before it starts to fail. We're seeing this a lot in full leather, and I'd say stay away from. Try to stay away from. Be careful with full rub, full leather. Not all full leather is bad. Um, but just be careful because some of the store-bought full leather, I've seen after three years, it starts to peel. People come to me, what can you do about it? I can't do anything about it. It's not real leather. <laughs> real leather we can do things. We can restore, but not, not full leather. Once that starts happening, forget it. You throw the piece away. It's a shame, too, because it looks good initially, but it doesn't last. I've had pieces I've upholstered 150 years old with leather on it, and the leather's fine, but everything else around it the burlap, the, the, the edge roll, and everything else is, is disintegrating. But the leather's fine. So, um, real leather, there's nothing like it. So, you know, we're, we're live, so now's the time to ask those questions live. But again, uh, if you're watching this, it's not live. Like Janine, she, she has three questions in here. That's fine. Um, and I'm answering hers from last week. So, so we're going to. Jimmy, Dad. Jimmy, Jimmy is the star of our show, if you've been watching, if you've signed up. Jimmy, Jimmy is uh, with us now live. So Jimmy, what, what's, what's up? He says, so with regards to material, how is real leather to work with? First pleather and how durable is wool? Well, we just talked a little bit about that fake leather, which, which uh, doesn't hold up as, as well as the real leather. Real leather is tough to work with. You know, when people say to me, do you have to be strong to be an upholsterer? Uh, no, except when you're working leather, because leather you need to stretch. You cannot use a tool. There's no such thing. I know people, if you want to Google it, you'll find these tools that stretch leather, but not for upholstery. You need to use your hands to stretch leather. And stretching leather is no easy task with your hands. And leather has to be stretched. So it's a good question. You want to stay away from shoe leather, which is impossible to upholster with. You have to do the right. The best leather out there is Italian leather, really. It's, it's really polished. It's soft. It stretches the way you want it to. But leathers, usually on a leather, we're, we're charging more for leather work, too, because it, because it is, it's more time-consuming. There's a lot to it. So Jimmy is doing a great job on his ottoman. I think um, if you're watching along, I, I think you'll, you'll, you'll agree. Um, he picked out a nice blue uh, diamond fabric. Um, it's a modern fabric, but the design is, is the oldest design in upholstery. 
Um, it, it was started in the actually horsehair fabric with that little little diamond shape, and it's it stood the test of time. And and Jimmy um, he liked it, so he bought it, and he's doing his ottoman. So thanks for the question. Got any more questions, Jimmy? Don't feel free to ask, please. Uh, let's see. So we got another question came in for from Patricia Baker. Oops, Patricia, sorry. Kevin, do you still run into pieces that intimidate you? Are there any X amount of types of upholstery that one that one will run into? I think I just talked about that Papa Bear chair. That, that's intimidating. Um, this piece here, I mean, it looks simple. This is intimidating because, like I said, one slip and I'm, I'm, I'm calling in the refinisher to help me fix it. And I got eight of them. That's intimidating. And um, I could never price this out enough to cover my cost on this. So sometimes um, you, you, you kind of learn from their experience, I guess, and, and maybe uh, go from there. But I had no way of knowing that when I looked at this job that there'd be so many staples. It looks like they might have been upholstered once and a lot of the staples were left in. Probably for the same reason I'm telling you, I'm going to leave some in because um, I didn't want to damage the, the edge. So, beautiful. Well, at least on this one here, I've decided to keep the foam, which is polyurethane. Um, and I think I've mentioned this before. It's, you could tell a good polyurethane if you look. I don't know if you're going to be able to see this on camera, but there's little speckles in this. And the speckles are indication of a high density foam. So, this is a good foam. It's not going to break down. The only thing I need to check, and I think I might do that now before I go on to any more questions. What I'm going to do is I'm going to look underneath. <clears throat> I'm going to cut the, 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 the cambric, I think, to see what type of, um, actually, you know what I might do? Let's just see what's going on with the seed on this. They've got a very firm piece of um, nylon stretcher, and then I feel underneath there some webbing, so it's in really good shape. Uh, I don't have to do anything to that, fortunately. I kind of make up a little bit of loss for lost time, but I still need to contend with these staples. I think I might try to take a few more out while, while I'm here. I'm going to try to use my tack remover to see if that might... I just, no, see, it's no good because it's too thick down at the end. So that's why I'm on the awl because um, it will lift. So the, my tack my tack remover was was pushing the staple down to the wood, and that's not good either. <clears throat> Stand up for one second. Sometimes standing up and getting above sometimes can help you pull the staple out. It's doing a little bit. And you know, um, I've shown you ways, I think, on YouTube and also on the online classes, how to speed yourself up. This is a case where you have to slow down a little bit. So this would be a long-term project, a longer-term project for me where I pick my time a little wisely to do this. I can't be tired when I do this because I'll make a mistake. Sounds like we had the local cheerleading squad go by. <laughs> You gotta be kidding me. The trick or treating. Really? And it's the, <laughs> the 25th. Wow. <laughs> Unbelievable. So I'm just feeling along with my thumb to see um, these staples are embedded, so I'm gonna leave those in there. And I'm just gonna, you're in a right handed person. Sometimes a little, little thing, little tip is that I like to work from the right to the left as I go along like this, and I'm checking with my thumb. Got a question here from Pedro, who is from Portugal. Hey Pedro, how are you? How are things in Portugal? You need Fatima, I hope. <laughs> so he says, uh, is it possible to finish a dinner chair corner without nail or cord? A corner. 
Did, did he say dining room chair? Dinner, uh, dinner, ch dinner chair, so probably dining room ah, chair. You mean just like this probably, right, Pedro? He's asking, is there any way to finish this? This is tough. Um, you have to staple in, a, in, a, in here, if I'm, if I'm reading you right. I'm going to give you two answers on this because I'm not sure exactly the exact chair. If you want to send a picture to Pat, uh, you can send a picture, can he, Patrick, if he wants? You can email us. You can email a picture if you want, but I'm going to try to answer this in two ways. So I think what you're asking, there is a way of doing it without any nails or double piping. The only way that I know of doing it, and I've seen this done, I'm not saying it's right, um, is to upholster right over this and tack underneath. Now, then you present a problem over here, though. Um, you're always going to have a problem with at least... To, on your corner here, you either have to tack it. Now, now in the old days, we had gimp tacks, a very small headed tack that would be put right here. That's the only way, if that's what I'm saying. But as far as right in this area, there's no way to have like a blind, I think what you're asking, like a blind seam here or something like that. You can't because this has to be stretched and tacked here. So when you, that's, that's, it's a good question, but it'd be impossible to do, you know, without something covering your staple work. But like I said, you could you can upholster over the whole thing. You'd have to pad this out a little bit, upholster over the whole thing. A lot of people don't want to cover up that nice wood though. You know. I think uh, if I didn't answer your question, Pedro, you can follow up um, with the photograph, email us. And they can reach us at Broadway if they go on Broadway. Upholstery on Broadway at uh, gmail.com. The best email is upholstery on Broadway at gmail.com. Upholstery on Broadway at gmail.com. Uh, another question from, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing it right. I think it's Kelly. Okay. Uh, it says, what tool are you using to remove the staples? Oh, uh, another tool that you can get in a hardware store. It's an awl. A W L, awl. And what it is pretty much, basically, it's just a pointed like a pointed screw that has a screwdriver handle but it's a point and it's sharp. Um, an ice pick, I wouldn't use an ice pick, an ice pick is too thin so what the, it, it, an awl is specifically what you want. So you see this is even a little bent, that didn't come like that, that's bent and used but it actually works to my favor. But it, it's thick, it's a thick stem here and a, and a point near the, near the bottom like that. And that's what I'm using. So what that does is it just kind of lifts the see how it lifts the staple. Kind of good without getting too close to the wood. Good questions coming up. Closer. And then take it out with the side cutters the rest of the way. See what I did there? So, if you're used to your, your side cutters instead of your mallet, you eliminate one tool. If you if you're really doing a really like precision job and you don't and you're not needing any heavy tacking, or you can use the back end of your side cutters. And you and what you do is that's a way to speed up. See what I'm doing now? Um, you eliminate one tool. But I always encourage beginners to get used to that, to the mallet. What I'm doing is more of an advanced thing, but you see how much easier it is? Eliminating a tool takes away a little bit of the time. See, that one's embedded. I want to be careful with that one. I'm feeling along with my finger to see if there's any of that is sticking up. Some, sometimes your, your side cutters can just grab a hold of a staple too, and that's, and that's always a lucky thing, right? But the prep work on this one, wow. I'm going to be well beyond my time. You know, I'll be honest with you, I don't think the customer would pay me um, what, it would, what I would have to charge her if I had known about this. I probably wouldn't have got the job. I'm glad I got the job. It's just... Not every job is profitable, and this is one of them. And I never, I'll tell you, I never go to a customer and say, I miscalculated the job, therefore I have to charge you more. I don't think that's right at all, so I don't do that. <clears throat> it doesn't happen that often, so I, I kind of you know, live with it. I can't strip a piece of furniture in a customer's house to find out how many staples are in. So it's my job when I'm, I'm looking at it, it's, it's my knowledge base that I need, to, I need to have in order to estimate a job properly. So, 
before we move on. Any other questions, Patrick? No, I got a lot of compliments, though. People love the channel. Oh, good. Thank you. Hey, keep it up. Actually, Pete, please uh, tell people to subscribe too, to the YouTube. We have to keep that going in conjunction with the online classes. Both are very important. And I think the YouTube videos are great. I think they do provide a service. Um, uh, again, though, I think the online classes, you learn so much more. Um, even when I'm doing this, when you're asking the questions live, I mean, these are good questions. Where do you get the side cutters? What are you using for a tool? You know, how, how can you switch off the tools? Why aren't you using the tag? Things like that. I would never think about that while I'm showing you a, a YouTube video, on the YouTube video, I'll be honest. But on the online classes and the, the question and answers, we get a lot, we get a lot, we get deeper into it, don't we? You know, and this is the type of thing that you would learn as an apprentice in, in the old days. And I, I, I yearn for the old days of uh, regular apprentices, um, younger people, younger men or women who, you know, come into a shop and, and the, the master upholsterer or technician or whatever or, or blacksmith or whatever has the time to teach and train somebody. You know, that's the problem today. That's the nice thing about the online classes. We hope that we get plenty of support. And thank you for the compliments keep, keep us going. But the, we need the support in order to keep that going because that's what you're getting with the online classes. You're getting an old-fashioned apprenticeship style education. And there's nothing more valuable than that. I was lucky to have it, um, but it's it's something that I find is not out in the marketplace these days. It's just we live in such a fast-paced world, you know. So keep keep those compliments coming. Please tell people to subscribe, share the share our videos, please. Um, we found out. I mentioned this last week that um, ten times more people watch our videos that aren't subscribed to them. Isn't that amazing? Only 1%, uh, is that right? Something like 1%, Patrick? I'm not sure. 1% of all the minutes of, of, of those people watching have subscribed to, the, to our station. We have, hey, we're happy we have over 6,000 subscribers. And turn on your notifications, because that'll uh, remind you. Turn to, on your notifications, right, like Patrick press said. Press that bell. This, to press the bell. Uh, I hate to just keep hopping on this, but it's so important um, for us. To, to have that YouTube station working because they're so interconnected, the YouTube station and the online classes. We really appreciate uh, uh, the people who have subscribed too, by the way. And we love the comments. I'm just going to keep going here and then look at another question that we got. I want to make sure we answer all these questions. Another one from Patricia. Uh, okay, where is the best place website to get supplies? Website that supplies just about everything would be ideal. Okay, Patricia, you have to be patient with me on this one. Um, I'm offering this kit, um, this, um, go back to this, the Fundamentals of Upholstery. It's going to come with instructions on how to order supplies um, for the kit. And what that does is going to build a relationship with the supplier. I'll tell you why this is important. Suppliers, there's not many of them. They, they, don't have, they don't have much time to talk to you if you call them. They, they get very impatient, a little grouchy. But what the kit's going to do is get you familiar with the terms of the, of the different materials. Um, I, I really do suggest that you, you I hate to say this, but purchase it. Um, we're going to be offering the supplies at cost. You're going to be using like a code with us to order them and also the frame and the ottoman. Once you do that, you're going to build this relationship. Uh, all that will be drop shipped to you. You're going to build a relationship with the supplier, which is really important. You really need to learn the logo. Something else that I've been doing is I've been I've been going over the index of upholstery items. And um, when you when you when you order through email, and, and you will be ordering through email most mostly. That's what I would recommend in the beginning. Um, I just don't want to give the name out right now because I'm not I'm not really fully ready for that. But just be patient with me, and I, I, I think I'm going to be able to help you because supplies, the proper supplies too. You're going to be learning from me on the online classes what the proper supplies to use. But you also need to know how to order those supplies. How much in bulk? Do you order bulk? How, how thick are the supplies? Some of the Dacrons, the thicker, they're wider. There's so many variables um, that um, you can ask those questions. Like, for instance, 
what what size Daycron do I use? How thick is the Daycron? The Daycron that I use is only one inch thick. And sometimes I'm even splitting that down. And they do have Daycron that's thicker than that, that I don't like. It's, it's like two inches thick, but it's too thick. And it's, it's, not, it's not workable at all. So not, you can make a mistake with, you can get the, you can get bonded Daycron, but you can get the, the wrong size or the wrong width. You know, so I know that I know it's frustrating right now, probably because I think Patricia, you might be entering into, you know, I don't know if you're yet in into the professional arena yet or not, but if if you are, you need a good supplier, but you need to know how to talk to them. Really, um, it's like upholstery has its own language, you know, like for instance, the edge roll that we were talking about earlier, the hand, the, I just showed you how to make a handmade uh, finger roll. You know, that's that's what they used to call finger roll. That's what I called it. That's what the old timers I worked with called it. And then the bigger one was called the fox edging. So when I call my supplier now and say I'd like I'd like 25 feet of fox edging, they go, "What are you talking about?" <laughs> they don't know. So I have to kind of adjust myself. Um, and I, you know, you can order the wrong supplies very easily. So be patient with me. I'll get I'll get that. We're we're really working hard on getting that offered on the on the website. Do we have any other more questions? Any more questions, Patrick? No. Nope. Okay. But we're like uh, today. We um, thank people who are watching right now. Um, that's great. And um, I mentioned the blog. That's good. So I'm going to go on now uh, to my index here again and talk a little bit about um, some of the other things. And I think I left off with the M's last week. So uh, muslin. So I want to talk about muslin. Muslin is a is an overused, overrated material in upholstery, and I'll tell you why. So I want to talk more about the history of muslin in, in furniture first. So the history of muslin was muslin was used almost exclusively to go over springs and horsehair, right? And it was used to go over to stabilize the horsehair over the springs. Where you'd have the springs, burlap, and the horsehair to stabilize all three elements to get it tighter, a little tighter. But more specifically, it was made. This is an awl, but they had a regulator that was pointed. You've seen my regulators. Let's see if I got it handy, but it doesn't matter. So the muslin was used to. So the the regulator would poke through the muslin, and and they would the upholsterer of old would work the horsehair through the muslin in order to smooth out the seat. That's pretty much it. Uh, now, sometimes we'd use it on arms. If there was a lot of horsehair on the arm, you would use it. Um, if it was a thin layer, not necessary. What I noticed was in the in the seventies and eighties, um, because we had such a wide gap in the instruction in, in the upholstery industry, um, where the apprenticeship program that I, um, the impromptu in apprenticeship program that I just talked about. Um, oftentimes impromptu, somebody would walk into your shop and say, hey, I want to be an apprentice, okay. You know, the time to do that. Or father and son, or father and daughter, or mother and daughter would, would, would teach. Um, so, um, I lost my train of thought there, but... So the muslin, um, getting back to the muslin. So, oh yeah, so in the 70s and 80s, um, um, a lot of people who were doing slip covers, and now the sewing tradition we have a stronger sewing t tradition, a, a link in the sewing and going way back, than we do upholstery. There, there, there seem to be wide gaps in the instruction of upholstery. That, that's why one of the reasons why I'm doing all this, by the way. Um, but um, slipcover people came in, drapery people came in, and kind of filled in a void uh, where, the, where there weren't any upholsterers. So they, but they took a lot of their talents and skills and knowledge from slip covering. Which is they line everything. They line the drapes. They they line their cushions. So they, they kind of put it. You know they would put muslin over this. You know which is fine, but it it creates double the amount of work, and it's not necessary. Absolutely not necessary to go over muslin over foam. Absolutely not necessary. So um, what you could do the bonded daycron is kind of nice because it takes the place of muslin and batting at the same time because you can pull it and staple it, and it's soft. So we've got a few questions here. Okay, Patrick, you got more questions. First, Jimmy, he wants to know: Will you be doing larger projects like love seats or over oversized chairs? Jimmy, you know that's a good question. I have space limitations here. We we live, 
we operate in a very expensive area of the East Coast, um, very expensive square footage. So uh, oftentimes I don't have the space to teach. Um, but that's a good question. I know a lot of people have it. Um, we do talk about a, a, the salty love seat on our blog. You might want to see that, Jimmy. And I, I, all my stories are true. A little embellishment, okay. But this is a true story about us. I, I can't give it away because the blog is the blog talks about it. But um, you can read about a, a love seat. But Jimmy, I hate to tell you right now in your online classes, you are restricted. You are restricted to chairs, ottomans, slip seats, things like that. We go up to a wing chair when we teach, but love seats are prohibited because you can imagine if I have five people in here, even the one person uh, would take up a lot of my studio space. So, so Kali has another question. Okay. So if you have horse hair on your chair, should you replace it or try to keep it? Oh no, keep it. Yeah, unless it's damaged somehow. It's got water damage or bug damage or something. Horse hair is wonderful. Usually it, what you see when you uncover a piece, when you take the fabric off and the cotton off and you see the, the horse hair there, people think it comes in rolls. But what you're actually seeing is that's been hand-picked by the upholsterer and put in one handful at a time and hand-stitched down. And it's beautiful. A lot of times you can take out the hand-stitching and take it off and then it looks, it's rolled. You can reuse it that way. Do you have any hair in show? Some people, I don't have any horse hair right now, Patrick. Some people, what some people do is they pick out, they, they clean the horse hair. What you can do that, be careful when you do this, uh, make sure you get a pillowcase, a zippered pillowcase. Put the horse hair in the pillowcase and um, make sure the zipper is locked. You, can, you might even want to put a hand stitch in it because if you let horse hair look, go in a washing machine, you're in trouble. But make sure it's, it's in there good and then you can wash it on gentle cycle with the gentle soap and then dry it and you've got fresh horse hair. Not only that, the horse hair turns soft. It, it, it comes, it looks and resembles a lot of times when it comes new to me and I could still get horse hair. It's very expensive. It's more than filet mignon, I think, uh, price per pound. A, a five pound thing of horse hair, let me just show you. It comes in a box like this and five pounds, five pounds is not a lot of horse hair. And at last check, I want to say it was like five hundred dollars for five pounds, uh, something like something. Like, that, that's the retail cost, something like that. Really expensive. So that's why you don't want to throw that away. That's like gold. Fine horse hair. Now, Jimmy and Jimmy's current class, which is, will be coming up, I think coming up in the future. I'll say right now because I don't have any dates for you on that one. He. A lot of people confuse horse hair with coconut fiber. So Jimmy discovered that he had coconut fiber. And coconut fiber is a little bit one grade under, I would say, horsehair for its uh, body. And you're looking, when you find a horsehair, when, you, when you're looking for batting, the, the first batting that you put, you're looking for something with body. So in other words, and this is another mistake that crossover people from other industries come in. They use bonded Dacron in places that they shouldn't, like for a base, and that's never a good idea. Bonded Dacron, let me just show you a piece. And it is a batting, but it's a top batting. <clears throat> so, you know, I hold this up. I can see through this. It's porous, and it's light. So you wouldn't use this in where your horse hair is now. You would not replace that with this because there's no body. You might want to use it on the top, under the fabric, but not not as the main batting. So, so this is a good question. I love I love horse hair. Um, I've done new horse hair cushions. Um, not often. It doesn't come up because of the expense and people don't see the value. <coughs> Any other questions right now, Patrick? Not at the moment. <coughs> okay, I'm gonna go on to the next. Thing. Needles. Needles are cool. We used to be called in the in the business, we used to fall under the needle arts. Or some people in the old days would be would refer to us as needle artists. And um, upholstery um, a hundred or hundred and fifty years ago or longer, actually back in George Washington's day, after the revolution, uh, right here in Boston, George Washington visited. 
and I would say this would probably be about 1782, let's say, or, or 17, 1780s maybe, maybe before that, I don't know. But I know that Washington came while he was president, and they had a parade of tradespeople, and one of the, you know, they had, they had um, you know, carpenters, they had millers, and, a, and an upholsterer. And what it was, was it was a parade of their goods. They, they showed their best work to the president. And they, they just lined up and just walked by him and presented their, their, their things to him. So it's a long tradition of upholstery. So, but back then, they would have been called needle artists. So I want to, get, I want to show you a couple of needles. That I have some old needles that I, I get kind of excited about. Um, probably used back then. I don't know. But... Um, you know, I, I think there was a little bit more pride back then with, our, with, the, with the trades. <clears throat> I think things are coming back that way, though. I think people have a lot of respect. They're starting to gain more respect for the trades again. But back then, there was a great regard. <clears throat> people used to hire, um, wealthy people would hire um, European upholsterers to stay in their house to do their work for months at a time, pay their fares and everything else. So that, that's a little history. It's kind of interesting. I want to share, to share another story that we might put in a blog. I'm not sure, Patrick. But um, I want to show you the needle before I tell you that story. <clears throat> so we have, I have this huge curved needle that was used for overstuffed horsehair work. So that's pretty cool. Um, so that's a, that's a curved needle. Curved needles come in different sizes. And the way you know curved needle size is from the point to the, to the loop. That's what you measure. I, I'm going to say this is a six inch, let's just see, six inch needle, right? And so it goes down all the way down to these little tiny hand stitching needles, which are two inch needles. And you can get them even smaller than that, maybe one and a half or one. And that, that just means that they're closer together like that. So that's cool. And then we have our button needles, putting buttons in mainly. We have a loop here and a point here. Some of them are double pointed. And a cool thing I like, which I'm going to be using soon. I got a call from this very, very uh, upscale company. I won't tell you the name, but they do event planning. For they have these events in different areas, and they call me because they is very, very uh, anxious. They had a button pop on a very uh, on a sofa somewhere in one of their venues, and they need somebody to come and fix it. And um, they so they hired me. I got to go out there. I'm kind of excited about where this is. Um, I don't know right now the exact location, but I have to go out equipped with a German needle, okay? And I have to take, the, now you've seen, uh, they can go on their YouTube, Patrick, to see me do this, to use a German needle to put a button back in. Now, I also just did a recent video on how to, uh, with some, how to do this with makeshift tools that people would have. A very ingenious, I think, idea. We already got a good comment from that, Patrick, by the way. Somebody put a button back in using a technique without the German needle, which I devised. You can go on and look. I admittedly wouldn't work as well as the German needle, but if you didn't have a German needle, who gets a German needle? Where are you going to get that, right? Um, so we're going to go out and, and put that button in and maybe save the day for this company that's uh, planning these venues, you know, these events. So I'm going to put this back. And um, then we have needles. We have upholstery. We get down to pins. That's an upholstery pin. We use that to set fabric while we're hand stitching it or something like that. Or other applications, like sometimes we use it to hold a, you know, burlap and things like that. And I think that's about it with the needles. Um, the talent using the needles, that's another thing, right? <laughs> so I'm going to check to see if we're caught up on our questions with people like Janine who wasn't who didn't, doesn't see us live. By the way, we're trying to find better times to present the live ones, but everybody's got well all over the place with that. So, But I, I think that the, the question and answer definitely, when we're following up like this, if they're a weak delay, but at least we're getting these answered. I just want to make sure. We got all of our uh, questions answered from, from last week, so that's good. So Jimmy wants to know. Jimmy wants to know another question. What is it, Jimmy? Yeah, he must have drank a lot of coffee. He seems hyped up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The caffeine sometimes helps. Although I have to tell you, I haven't had caffeine in 31 days, so that's not that's not the reason. I just think, 
Jimmy had come in today for a class, and I think Jimmy was my caffeine fix today. He he was like one of the he he came in all dressed in black, like he was going to a a, a concert for a, you know, like he was going to perform at a concert, and he got me all hyped up. So uh, he wants to know. <laughs> when using horse hair or coconut hair, is it necessary to sew it to the burlap and what type of twine? Well, I noticed that you said coconut hair. It's not really coconut <laughs> <laughs> hair. Uh, coconuts, as far as I know, don't grow hair. <laughs> they grow fiber. But that's okay. Uh, 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 the horses grow hair. Now, that brings up a good question, a good question about horse hair. Now, I do want to say, I love animals. We have a beautiful dog, a little cocker spaniel. Uh, cocker, what is she? Golden cocker. Golden cocker. She's about 22 pounds, and we love her to death. But uh, I do love animals. Some people think that the horses uh, don't survive with the horse hair that we use. But the good news is, folks, these are horses. They're imported. Um, this is an import from uh, Poland. They're Polish horses. I'm not sure the type of horse. We actually have somebody watching from Poland. So. From Poland, my Poland friend. Hello. I'm not sure if she's still with us, but Sherry. Sherry, yeah. she's from Poland. She might even know where the where the horse farm is. Now I got a little off subject. We'll go back to Jimmy's question in a minute. But the good thing is, they shave the horses. They don't kill the horse. Horse hair does not come from the tail or the mane like you get in some some uh, amusement parks and some merry-go-rounds. We're not into that. Uh, but this is shaved. Um, and they keep these horses very healthy because this is a good living for these farmers who have these horse farms, let me tell you, because this is expensive. So these horses are well fed and well taken care of. I could tell because the hair comes in very, it was like they were using Prell or something, you know. So, what was Jimmy's question? I got a little sidetracked there because is it Jimmy... Is necessary to sew it to the burlap and what type of twine? To sew it to the burlap, Jimmy actually did that. He sewed, you have to sew, uh, sew... It depends. Now, if you're using, yeah, you always want to sew to the burlap in probably almost every application using horse hair. And I just showed you some curb needles that we use for that, for that purpose. That's a good question, Jimmy. Now, we, 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 we don't want to get into a lot of biology with Jimmy because um, <laughs> I don't know too much. But I did know that coconuts don't, don't not, do not grow hair. Got another question. From Jimmy? No, this is from Klee Girl 216 Okay. So she wants to know, so my cousin has a great, my cousin has my great grandmother's wing chair, but it's been in the house with cats and smokers. Will the smell come out of it if reupholstered? Yeah, that's a tough one. i tell you, my experience with smokers, first of all, non-smokers like me, I could smell somebody smoking a cigarette down the block, and that's true. It, it, it way down the block, and my I'm always on guard for that because it's a, it's like matches to gasoline, upholsteries to smoke. Forget about it. You never get rid of it. If you think you got rid of it, the smoke. If it, let's say you get grandma's chair in the house, you smell the smoke, and five years go by, and you don't smell it. All of a sudden, you add a little moisture or it's a little humidity, and then you smell it. I hate to tell you, you have to start from the frame. I very rarely tell people that. You go right down to the frame. I had two chairs in here not too long ago. Same situation. And uh, the customer did not smoke. And she did not want to smell the smoke. And she could smell the smoke from these chairs years and years. And uh, Hey, listen, don't smoke, folks, because you imagine what it does to your lungs. <laughs> but uh, this stays, it stays in the fabric. If it's not in the fabric, it's in the cotton. It's not in the cotton, it's in the burlap. And it goes right down into the layers. And you've got to go right down to the frame. Sorry about that. It does not go away. Good question, though. We have, I know we have a video on cat damage, but not cat smell. No, we got to do that one. Soon. Well, forget about cat smell too. You know, <laughs> when a cat does his business, nothing will get it out. You have to stop. That's another ground zero, man. You have to take the, the right down to the frame. You never get rid of it. That's my experience. So. Those are good questions. So unfortunately, when you're talking price, if you if you if you're hiring somebody to do that, your price is at least just doubled, at least just doubled. So Jimmy, I hope that you're home googling coconut hair, and and, and knowing the difference between coconut uh, and um, it's not horse hair fiber. It's horse it's horse hair. It's, it's not coconut hair. It's coconut fiber. 
So I hope, <laughs> we, hope we got that straight. <laughs> Maybe we gotta do a video on that for him. That's pretty good though. I like that. I like Jimmy. He's a great guy. He's, he's got, he comes in here. Today I think he earned two gold stars or something. I told him that if he earned so many stars, he might be walking out of here with the Milky Way. I don't know. So, do we have any other questions, Patrick? No, I think that question from Queen Girl is a good good place to end the chat for today. I think that was a really good Yeah, question. that was fast moving, fast paced. And uh, so, I'd like to thank all of you for watching. And, and even after, like I said, you're watching this uh, not live, don't, don't be afraid to ask the questions and email us. And what should they email, Patrick? Is it upholsteryonbroadway at gmail.com? Yep. And, um, and comment, comment on the video even, because I can... That's where I got the questions today. Oh, um, yeah. Patrick just had a good point on the YouTube video that you, on the rewind. In the reruns, comments. In the comments section, comment. And don't forget, if you haven't subscribed, subscribe. And we'll see you next week. Thank you again.